Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 46 of the ForensicWeek.com show. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from sunny Florida, Indian Shores. CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Tonight, Forensic Art and Illustration with guest Sandy Enslow, a graphic artist coordinator and forensic artist for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Our intention this evening is to address the role that forensic artists play in the identification of victims and suspects. ForensicWeek.com is a talk show, ladies and gentlemen, that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists and investigators, real law enforcement officers, and real counterintelligence experts who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live right here on your desktop every Thursday evening 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweed.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+, a social networking service. Forensic IQ Update Report. Researched and presented live by my student interns from the University of Maryland, keep you up on current issues, events, and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community. Student producers and interns with us this evening are from the George Washington University Department of Forensic Science, Laura Petrucci, our producer. From Baltimore County, Maryland, Stevenson University's Derek Wong, our co-producer. And Noel Andres, brand new student intern working with me this semester. He was a student of mine last semester from the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Those are our students who will be with us this evening. Before I introduce our guests, though, let's begin this evening's discussion with producer Laura Petrucci telling us and telling our, our listeners how they can ask questions uh, and participate in the show. Laura? Thanks, Tom. Hey everyone, and thank you for watching ForensicWeek.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the future shows, please email us at ForensicWeek at email.com. If you are watching this show live and you have a question for our guests, you can use the comment box below and we will bring that up and ask for you. If you like this episode, please click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. You can watch all archived shows 24-7 online at ForensicWeek.com. You can also find us on Facebook by searching the ForensicWeek.com show, like and share our page. Thank you, and back to you, Tom. Thank you, Laura. Before I introduce our guests, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, some training that out, that's out there. Searchy Laboratories has a new webinar called Latent Print Basics, Tips, and Techniques. Uh, it's a free webinar from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, January 29th, 2014, so that's in a couple of weeks. Um, latent prints left behind during the commission of a crime can be valuable pieces of evidence, as many of our listeners know, uh, and uh, you really need to make sure that you understand um, the uh, what fingerprints can and cannot do for you. Uh, on top of this, the, the CSI effect has contributed to some common misconceptions are, uh, about what is possible with latent prints. So if you want to know exactly what is possible, uh, this webinar with Searchy Laboratories, who uh, um, is one of the finest organizations in, um, uh, in the fingerprint business, um, then go see their training and, and recommendations from Tom Curtis, one of uh, Searchy's uh, master trainers. So um, for those of you who are interested, uh, you need to register right away, and uh, um, Derek uh, is putting that up right now, the uh, URL for that, uh, and you can register, and uh, I guarantee you, for those of you who want to learn more um, about fingerprints, either as a student or a, a law enforcement officer or attorneys who want to better understand that, uh, I would strongly suggest that you participate uh, in that, uh, that uh, free training. Okay, Sandy Enslow, our guest. Sandy is a graphic arts coordinator and a forensic artist for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. As a 20-year veteran, she has sketched well over a thousand composites and testified hundreds of times uh, in court. 
Her efforts have been contributed to the convictions of hundreds of felonies. Felons. She lectures at the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Homicide School and Detective College. She co-manages the uh, LinkedIn Forensics Arts Discussion Group, which has a membership of over 250 national and international professional forensic artists. She is a, an associate member of the general section of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, where she and I met via the email, and tonight's the first time we're getting to look at each other face to face. Uh, and she was uh, uh, gracious to help me um, when I was preparing to host the webinar for the American Academy of Forensic Science. Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest, Sandy Enslow. Sandy, thank you so much for being here this evening. Tom, thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. It's an honor. Well, we're going to start right in because we know uh, how time uh, goes so quickly here. You know, I, I introduced this as forensic art and illustration. Uh, and when we talk about forensic art, we talk about illustrations, graphic arts, uh, sculpturing. Tell us what the field of forensic art encompasses. Well, there's quite a few disciplines that are underneath that umbrella. There is composites, facial reconstructions, post-mortem drawings, um, digital imaging, a, a variety of different kinds. But the bottom line is, is that forensic art assists the detective. They are image images that are information generating, and that's where they help the detective. Very good. Now, now I got to ask a question here because I cannot see you right now. And okay. uh, Laura, are you seeing her? Yes, I can see her. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, now all of a sudden, now I see you, Sandy. Okay, I was just concerned that if I wasn't seeing and no one else was. Okay, very good. So, um, now. How many, uh, how many forensic artists are out there right now? Well, I don't have an exact number by any means, but I can tell you that we are, uh, we have a, a membership of around 275 plus forensic artists that are connected to a law enforcement agency that participate in the forensic artists discussion group. And uh, that means they're an artist, either they're a full-time or a part-time artist. Um, they could be sworn or civilian. They might volunteer. They might be a contract artist, or they might be a reserve that is drawing for their agency. Now, you are a civilian uh, employee for the uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, correct? What percentage of those who are considered forensic artists are... Um, Civilian versus uh, sworn officers. I do not know. Don't know. No. And is there? Does any anybody believe that you should be an office, uh, a police officer, or have that training uh, to be an effective forensic artist, or uh, does it matter? Or what, what's your feelings towards that? I whether you're sworn or civilian, you need to be accountable. You need to be a stakeholder within your agency. Um, you must have forensic training. You can have all the artistic ability and all the other artistic training. You went to some sort of an art school somewhere. But without the forensic training, you're sorely lacking. It's incredibly important in order to do this job right. Okay. Now, if somebody who uh, is considered a forensic artist, does that... Does that mean they can be a, they can do sculpturing? They can do re, uh, facial reconstructions? Can they do all those things? Uh, or are there some artists that are specialized in certain areas? Uh, uh, some artists specialize in in certain areas, and some of us do a wide variety of different kinds of forensic art. I at my agency, I've learned to do age progressions, composites digital imaging, um, putting together um, facial reconstructions. Uh, we also do crime scene diagrams. We do a lot of, and every agency might have a different call for their, for their artist to specialize or do something. And at my agency, we only do 
the 2D facial reconstructions. Um, while I've been trained to do the 3D clay reconstructions, um, it's very time consuming and I don't do those. Well, we have two explain to us the difference. Explain the, the difference between the two. Okay. Um, in one case, and we do have a slide of it, but I don't know the number. Um, in in one case, for 2D reconstruction, we put the markers on the skull. We have them. We we shoot the skull. We get a picture of it in Frankfurt horizontal position and we then draw as a 2D illustration and I do have that uh, one of those cases up. Um, with clay in the 3D version you take that skull and you put clay on the skull and you build up to where those markers are and, um, and I see you, that slide right there. Yes and here I am I'm looking uh, the markers are on the skull and I'm checking to see that everything is in place. Are the markers going to stay? Are they going to fall off? Because I have to transport it down the hall into the next, at the crime lab, down the hall to the next room t for the photographers to shoot it for me. And um, so you just, you know, you measure twice and before, you know, and cut once. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you can see. Uh, some of the things. So once the photograph is done, and 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 to my liking, I'm very satisfied with it. We start to build the drawing up, and I'm here at my at my drafting table. I even have my photographs are up on the um, are up on my screen, and I'm developing what I think this person may look like. Um, we had uh, we had some conflicting information, so. I didn't know, and the detectives were not able to help me, nor was the um, the anthropologist, as to how heavy this victim might be. We knew she was a young woman, but there was a chance that she was fairly heavy. So I had to choose which markers I was going to go with, the more obese markers, which are thicker and heavier, there are a little bit more to them, or the average. And I went with the average um, markers. So if you go to the next so it, it, slide. Oh. Let, me, let me just stop there for one second. So if yes. two different artists were, uh, were doing this at different times, yes. uh, they, they, they could come up with two different um, composites, correct? Not exactly, no. The skull is going right. to tell you only one thing. The difference is, is that if they don't use the same methodology and the same markers um, depending on, on, on what facial thickness charts they use. Um, for example, one artist goes with the obese. They're saying, look, she's a size 14. Size 14 is not obese by any means, but uh, whereas the other artist goes with the thinner average weight model, um, there is going to be a difference in their looks. And you'll see okay. that in, in the comparison page. Okay, why don't we do this. Uh, um, Derek, why don't you put up those slides again, and I'm going to shut up for a second. I'm going to let you go through some of those slides, and, and you can explain okay. them to uh, our, um, our viewers, okay? Sure. Um, okay, and the picture that's up now is the comparison. She was identified. Uh, we were very fortunate that uh, she got identified. The name of the game in facial reconstruction is proportion. And I want to talk about what I got wrong first, and I'm more than happy to explain that and show that to you. The, draw, the, the drawing shows her thinner, but the photograph we, we got of her is a DMV photo in better times. As it turns out, she was a drug user, a heroin user. So chances are, at the time of her death, she was probably using, she was found out in a wash. and. Um, she was probably thinner than the photograph you see here. Unfortunately, they don't have a picture of her at the time that she died. So we don't have that to compare. However, um, another thing that I got wrong, and it can't be helped, is the, the fullness of her lips. I overshot that. I'm not afraid to tell you that that, uh, that didn't work out for me. Her lips were not as thin. 
But let me talk about what did go right, and that is, again, uh, what the skull tells you. You can look at the top of her head and come down to her hairline. And I got her hairline matching up. We laid in her eyebrows. I put in her, um, her eyebrows, her eyes, her nose. And you can take a look and see uh, the way her nose is built and the way I illustrated her nose uh, uh, was, was right on. And I'm really happy about that. We come down to where her mouth is. Again, my lips are too full, but we placed her mouth in the right place, and we placed her chin. She has this very little petite chin, and, and we got that. I also, looking at the skull, have no way to know how she wore her hair at the time that she died. And in the DMV photo, she's got very short hair. The hair that I was able to see at the... Um, in the photos that I got uh, uh, from the detective, um, her hair was longer. But that doesn't matter. The bottom line is, is that overall, her family recognized her and came forward. So uh, that was, oh, that's the question I was going to ask. So you're telling me that, okay, you have a skeleton, uh, you created this composite, and did you put it out on, uh, in the newspapers? How did the family see it? There was a press conference put out by the coroner's office. They also were able to find, and this is part of the digital imaging that I've talked about, um, they were, some of her, uh, 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 as far as her skull went, she was, there wasn't much left of any of the soft tissue. But down on one ankle, she had one ankle that uh, the skin was kind of preserved, um, and we were able to see a very faint, vague notion of a, of a tattoo. So we went out and uh, uh, Ignacio Mendoza from my office uh, tracked down and found a similar uh, tattoo and um, uh, rendered it and we put it out with the drawing and it helped the family go, yes, this is her. So success, you know, bottom line is, you know, again, this is ForensicWeek.com. This is not CSI or any of those uh, shows on network television. We tell it the way it is, and I appreciate and respect you for telling us, you know, what you got wrong. The bottom line is you got it right at the end. Uh, yes. And um, unlike what we, we see on television that, you know, everything works out perfectly and it's amazing and, you, you know, the reality is that, you know, you, with with the evidence that you had and the data you had, you created an image that ultimately, uh, together with other evidence, caused the family to say, "Hey, that's my daughter." And then I assume DNA confirmed it, etc. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. Right. Yes. Great. Great. Derek, did you have a question? Um. Well, my question. Um. I have a, just a general question about uh, forensic artistry. So, uh, do most forensic artists create drawings by hand? Because I saw in uh, one of the slides that you had before, uh, you had a computer set up where you're working. So, do you use any computer software to help you with your drawings? Um, yes, we do. We use Photoshop. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot that we that we utilize, um, but we don't have any facial imaging software. We don't use that. We, we draw by hand. The name of the game is information, and it's garbage in and garbage out. If you don't have the best possible drawing that you can deliver to the detective, uh, you may not get responses. So we hand draw our drawings, but we do use computers. I'm on a computer every day. I see. So what about police departments that don't have access to... Um, Forensic artists, do they have special programs that they use for um, for witnesses to kind of draw out um, suspects' faces? There's a variety of uh, there's a variety of software out there that that is used from time to time. And um, if you're talking about a part one crime, you should uh, you know if you don't have a forensic artist in your agency. There's got to be somebody nearby or within the county or the next county over you can find that might extend professional courtesy 
to your agency from theirs that might assist you if it's a part one crime. Most of the time, a lot of agencies will use a uh, forensic art, uh, uh, a software program for a part two crime, a lower level crime that is of of not an emergent nature. Okay, so so how do the two compare? Like the uh, the person and the the program. What are the differences? Um, what are the benefits of having a real person do it? You have a chance if you have a trained forensic artist, not just an artist off the street, but someone who has had training and has skill. And that technical skill comes from the interview, um, handling distraught witnesses, um, dealing with difficult witnesses. Not everybody comes to the table real happy. And um, some people are very worried about, uh, 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 you know, is there going to be retribution? Do I really want to cooperate? Um, being able to handle those people and um, be able to deliver a drawing, that this takes a lot of training and uh, it's not what you get in art school. Compared to a program, the program, uh, the operator who sits at a program at a keyboard, they only have whatever the program is available to them. And as styles change and hairstyles and clothing and makeup things, styles go on, gang styles change, and as that goes on, these programs are not updated. So you may have, as an operator at the keyboard, you may have a witness describing something to you that you do not have in, in the setup, in, in what's available to you. It's, it's very limited. Let, let me, uh, let me uh, interject here. Uh, what I'd like, because I, I just went through the slides that you provided. I'd, I'd love you to go through each slide and just kind of tell us a little bit about what you did and, um, sure. and, and what the kind of case is. So, uh, Derek, if you could just uh, bring the slides up after the ones we just saw or wherever you want to start. And uh, if you could just go through each one of them, just tell us a little bit about what they are and, and how you got there. We'd appreciate that. I have All a right. question, Tom. Yes, yeah. go ahead, Laura. Um, I was just wondering, Sandy, how long does it generally take, like, the process of um, creating one of these drawings of a um, victim? How long does that take? And also, what type of training did you go through to learn um, the different facial features and everything? Um, first of all, every artist is different. Every forensic artist kind of approaches it their own way, and um, I'm on the shorter end of the scale. I, I draw fairly quickly. Um, I was a commercial illustrator and graphic designer before I came to this crazy life. Mm -hmm. And um, so some artists, you know, I'll take maybe an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, thereabouts. Yeah. But some artists are three or four hours, and some artists are longer than that. Um, I know out here in Los Angeles, my detectives are expecting me to draw fairly quickly. And especially because sometimes you've got more than one composite. We have a lot of, um, especially with homicides, there can be a, a takeover robbery that goes wrong. And you've got a driver outside. You've got a, um, so I've got one witness that saw the driver. And then inside, you've got uh, uh, someone at the cashier that saw the shooter and someone else who saw the backup guy who was, was, was backing him up. And you end up with two, three, four drawings over the course of a night with different people. And if I take a long time, Man, that's a that's a that's a long period of time to be trying to deliver these images. So I draw fairly quickly, but it just depends on the on the artist. And um, I can't, you know, there is no magic number there, Laura, on that. Um, to go back to my training, for me personally, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree at uh, Cal State University at Los Angeles, and my uh, my my degree was in illustration and graphic design. When I came and I was hired by the LA County Sheriff's Department, I was trained in forensic art by the deputies that were already in my unit. And my unit has been around since 1956. So it's almost 58 years old now. Um, we no longer have uh, sworn officers in our unit. We only have civilians. 
Um, but after that, about five years after, uh, I came on in 94. By 1999, I had a body of work and I was able to apply to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And they have a three-week course that I went to and successfully uh, graduated from. And then a couple years later, in 2001, I went to Northwestern University, the Center for Public Safety. Lois Gibson has a one-week course there that I also took. So, um, you know, that's, that's the training that I have, as well as now 20 years of experience out here in Los Angeles. Do you want 20 me to years of, 20 years of experience in Los Angeles, I think, could do, uh, do a lot. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's always uh, jumping out here. Yeah. Derek, uh, Derek has your slides up, so why don't, um, why don't we just run through them, and then if, uh, if there are any other okay. questions, we'll go, we'll go there. Okay. That sounds good. Um, well, well, this example is, is a really good example. Um, operators utilizing a software program are doing the best they can, and I understand that. This is an example that was out in the public, it's out in the media. On the right hand side is the actual booking photo of the suspect. On the left hand side is the actual composite drawing. And you can see that, uh, first of all, the hat doesn't sit correctly on the head. It, it, I'm okay with it being skewed, but it is not fitting correctly. The hair is like Cocker Spaniel dog ears. Not that I'm not <laughs> Cocker Spaniels. I like Cocker Spaniels. Don't go there. Um, but look at these eyebrows. These are gigantic furry things. I don't know what they are. And the last thing that I want to point out is the five o'clock shadow on a feminine face. Now, what up with that? I, I understand that she could be a mass murderer somewhere, but that is wrong to put a five o'clock shadow on a feminine face. The operator of this program did not have many options because in many instances these programs don't uh, don't differentiate between male and female and viva la difference there is a difference and it shows well first of all you're absolutely correct I, I've, I've recognized that for a long time that there is a difference um, but let me so you're telling me that the picture on the left the guy with the hat uh, the uh, image done with software that was actually put out to look for somebody that actually was the person on the right? That is correct. All right. How did they find her eventually? You know, that I do not know. This was, um, this was an example that was given to me from another part of the country, and they just said, you've got to use this when you're lecturing, when you're talking, because this shows, you know, how difficult it is to, number one, render. And one of the, you know, the predicate is wrong and it's, is, is with the facial imaging software that it's going to be easy. Sign up, buy our program for a thousand, five thousand, ninety thousand dollars and you just push the button and everything is there. The witnesses are not happy, the detective is frustrated, the operator is frustrated um, and you know they're wondering why it doesn't look so good, and and it's it doesn't represent the agency very well. It's very well, laughable. Let me ask you a question. How about the fact that we 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 all recognize now that eyewitness testimony is not as um, effective as we've thought it ha uh, it was in the past. Uh, so when you're creating um, um, a composite, uh, whether you're using software or whether you're doing it um, uh, with an artist. Uh, you are relying on an eyewitness's memory. That is how correct. Do you, how do you attempt to try to get good memory if that's such if there's such thing um, uh, from from this witness or victim to to ensure that you're getting the best possible composite? First and foremost, we utilize um, the cognitive interview, and getting trained in the cognitive interview is a very important key part of being a forensic artist because you need to calm the witness down, get them to focus, and a lot of these pop up people are not focused. They're, they're, they can be very, very difficult and, and not that they're meaning to be, but you have to walk them through 
and through the process and oftentimes through some very traumatic moments to recollect, recall or recognize and, um, and give information to you. A lot of witnesses are very dubious about trying to go through this process and once you start to get an image down on the page they start to realize that the image in their head is coming to life. Suddenly they're buying into the process and they're working with you and are these drawings portraits? They are not. They're not meant to be. Um, they're meant to be image information generating images to get that that detective more information to move the ball down the field. And I just a real quick note on um, eyewitness testimony. It is what it is. And it's when people say to me, well, it's not reliable. And I said, quite frankly, sometimes fingerprints, sometimes DNA. There, there's a lot of things that prove themselves not to work out too well. The bottom line is that if you if this witness will work with you you try your best to support the case and get an image drawn uh, nobody goes to the electric chair off of a composite but it is corroboration and ultimately the juries are fine with it they're really happy when they can see a drawing that looks like the suspect who is sitting in court the defendant and they understand what they want to know was is is the witness sincere? And when they see that the image is similar, they're satisfied. I would I would ma imagine now with DNA that uh, in most cases when you ultimately identify a, uh, a suspect or a victim, because we, and we talked about that in that previous case, that sure. you ha DNA can always corroborate you know, the, the image that was created. Is that a fair enough statement? Well, I think that, I, I think that the, the DNA uh, seals the deal. We're always happy when DNA comes in or fingerprints come in or can do those things. Mm -hmm. As forensic artists, we're all about supporting the case. It's all about the case. It's all about supporting the victim, having empathy for that victim. Um, when, when the, when the, but what really happens is that the composite corroborates even more what the DNA is already saying mm -hmm. that um, and in court the jury is able to look at something tangible with DNA that's a very intangible thing fingerprints are more tangible but firearms they're difficult they're not that as tangible as being able to see and this is something that the the juries understand let me ask you, uh, have you ever used hypnosis um, uh, or ha had a forensic hypnotist play, induce a victim or a witness uh, under hypnosis to help them recall a more clear, vivid uh, image? Yes, I have. I've had two different cases in my uh, experience where I worked with a hypnotist and there were three of us in the room, uh, the witness, the hypnotist, and myself. And in both cases, um, they worked out fairly well. Good. Uh, Good. All right, let's continue with uh, the slides. Uh, Derek? This is a... Uh, this is a... This is a really good example of some of the difficulty that we have because we get a booking photo for forensic artists, we like to be able to show a booking photo with a drawing. This is what I drew. This is what he ended up as. And in this particular case, the, the, the suspect is lifting up his head. You're almost looking down his nostrils. And it skews the way the image looks. But the detectives were over the moon. This, this was a, a 2005 homicide. And, um, and the jury bought it as well they saw what the witness saw and what the witness described to me this defendant had deep set eyes you'll notice that they, he, the witness didn't describe that little spike at the time that the booking photo was taken that spike might not have been there um, the witness never described any of the moles that are on the face here that doesn't matter um, the overall image is very similar 
and uh, the jury bought it, the jury liked it, and everything else that they had with this case, and this man is now uh, serving 25 years to life. I noticed that he has a tattoo on his neck. Um, yes. The, the, wit the witness obviously never just saw that or talked about that? That is correct. Um, if they don't see it, they're not going to describe it to me. In many instances, they've only got just a few moments. They've got the gun in their face. They have a quick look. They've passed by somebody. Um, we, we really have a rough ho road to travel down as forensic artists because um, we're, we're really judged by our images, but you know, I, somebody else trying to step into our shoes may not have as e an easy time of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is a comparison that also it, it shows the difficulty that we have um, the composite is in the middle. It's an 09 composite. And um, I have to give a shout out here to Jeannie McGee, who is the crime analyst for the Special Victims Bureau, uh, which uh, investigates uh, uh, sex crimes and, and juvenile, and juvenile uh, uh, crimes. And um, she went back two years to find someone who... Uh, looked similar that seemed like they had the similar um, MO and then she pulled up his booking photo which is on the left hand side and um, she was thrilled to see to see how that how that matched up I wasn't so happy with it I mean I was okay they they got him he was convicted everything was good but when you look at that picture his um, his nose looks very slim and yet in the drawing, he's got a little bit of a schnoz there. <laughs> so I kind of just a little bit griped to Jeannie McGee, who um, is a wonderful lady. And she said, hold on. And she went back in, and she pulled up his, his DMV photo. And there, lo and behold, I can see the four nose that the witness had described to me. It was the lighting of the booking photo that altered the way they look. So when I'm teaching detectives how to utilize a forensic artist, I let them know that you just can't look at one booking photo. You may want to look at a DMV photo. The lighting may change things or skew things. Your composite artist may have drawn an excellent drawing, but you're looking at a picture under not ideal circumstances. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. You got the hair right. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, what is this next one? I'm confused by this next one. Okay. Um, you know, at least out here in Los Angeles, we deal with a lot of gangsters, and it has been for quite some time now, really hardcore gangsters will tattoo their entire face. And once you have determined who your suspect is, you've got to put a six-pack together and show it to your your victims or your witnesses. The, the guy in the top, the guy in the top left looks like uh, Noel uh, Andres a little bit there, <laughs> doesn't he? I think he does. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. So here we are with this six-pack, and. Um, and uh, this, this six-pack, um, he's in position number four. This is our suspect. We can't show this to the witness because it's skewed. This is not a fair level comparison field. So what, what the detectives do is they call my unit, and <laughs> what we do is we level the playing field. And you know what? Number five doesn't get any better. M number five is, is, I don't know what's up with that guy. But um, we put tattoos similar or almost of the same. And we, we put everybody in the same black with a similar gray background. Just so a defense attorney can't beef this. And this allows the, def the, the detective to move forward. The, um, and we do this very quickly. Uh, we're good at it. And... Um, and it helps our detectives go forward. So this is one ish, This is one um, uh, example of digital imaging. Let me ask you: How did the defense argue this? They had to. Uh, they had an attempt to argue it, anyways. 
Well, I wasn't part of this case other than we did the, we did the, um, uh, uh, we evened out the six pack. So that, um, yeah, the witness only saw this secondary one. They never saw the first one. Mm -hmm. And they had to sit there and pick out which, which suspect, which they did. Um, and um, the, the, the detective, uh, I was sorry, the defense attorney cannot uh, gripe about it at all because um, we have uh, given them a level playing field to choose from. Yeah, uh, that's great. And the, so the black shirt is actually digital also. The black shirt and all those tattoos. Those, those men don't have those tattoos. Yeah. Great. Some of those guys would be very upset if they found out they were from, you know, Puente. Yeah. I'd like to see uh, Noel with one of those tattoos. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> okay, go um, ahead. That, that's good. That, I, I, was, I was a little confused by that, but now you've explained it. That's great. Let's go to the next one. This is an image of, uh, this is a case um, from 2004 of a shooting at a Subway sandwich shop. And um, they think that the gun went off by accident, but the clerk was shot and killed. There were two people, a, a husband and wife, elderly husband and wife, who were in the uh, sandwich shop eating at the time. And the wife had gotten up and she had walked over to the uh, the potato chips, so she, and her husband was still sitting in the cafeteria, the little the little uh, restaurant area. These uh, uh, there's two gangsters. They come in and the the this one gangster with the hood on whipped around and he came up and he sat down in the wife's chair opposite the um, the husband and he lifted up his shirt and showed him the gun and said. I don't expect any trouble from you. And the husband just nodded and said, no problem, no, 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 no problem. So he had a, he had a full, full frontal look at the guy face to face. Then the gangster went up and uh, brought out the gun and, you know, the gun went off. Uh, the husband immediately got up to chase after, to try to get to his wife. And she fell down. She was, and then he fell down. Um, and they robbed the store. There was a, there's another one with them. So Whittier PD said, look, I've got, we've got two people that we would like you to sit down with and get these drawings of these suspects. So I did. I sat down with them, and neither one, the husband or the wife, emotionally, they couldn't do it. So we had to let them go, and they were afraid. I understand that. Um, I asked them, I said, guys, what else have you got for me here? You, do you have any video? They said, oh, yeah, we got video. And I said, what are you holding out on me for? Crank it up. Let me have it. And uh, they gave me a CD of the video and the stills, and I took it home. You're seeing just one still here, but I developed these drawings, uh, and you're seeing only one drawing. And then now you're seeing with it the actual booking photo that was from this. And this, again, this composite, this is an approximation from video, is a, uh, is just, in, it's a, it's an aid. And what it did was it corroborated because they're getting more information from the streets. Detectives are working these things hard and they do, they do, are hoping that we're going to produce something that will corroborate or eliminate somebody as they're working through what they've got. And they had information on the, on the street and when I developed these drawings, they were already looking at these guys, and it all came together for them. Is that unusual to, uh, uh, to do a composite from a, a surveillance photograph when the, the surveillance photograph is really not very clear? No, it's not at all. Um, a lot has to do with um, the lighting and the environment, how good is the video, and frankly, traditionally, Proverbially, they're they're all not very great, but um, you take what you can get and you try to develop some sort of an approximation, and a lot has to do with lighting source, so that um, like right now, I'm looking at Noel and the light is above him, so it's really showing his brow, and it's showing his nose and his cheekbones. 
and um, his chin and his mustache and beard, they're a little bit more in shadow. When you're looking at a suspect, you're looking for that lighting, and what is it telling you? Um, and that's what you, you work from. Very good. Very good. All right. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this one. Noel, do you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I actually have a question. Has there, ever been, has there ever been an occasion where you had to reconstruct or prepare an illustration of an assailant based on vague details or characteristics given by a victim? Well, yeah, they all. You know, the, the, the details, you know, the, vict uh, the victim or the witness, either one, has to give you whatever they've got. They're, they're, you know, and you have to try to assemble a picture. But I can talk about a very unique case that I had, which is still outstanding. However, I can talk about the first part of it. I had two detectives that had a rape victim at the hospital. And they said, you need to come down. And it, I had to drive across the county and get there. And when I got into um, the, the county hospital that she was in, I walked into the place where they had her. She's in bed, and her jaw is broken and hanging off to one side. So she can barely say yes or no. Her talking ability was minimal. And I said hello to her and introduced myself, and I was light and loveliness. And then I turned around to the two detectives who were women, and I said, we need to speak outside. And I got them outside well away from our victim and said, what the fuck are you talking about? How am I supposed to do this? And she was raped by two gangsters and beaten up pretty badly. And they said, we need something. We need something. You've got to do something. We don't have anything here. You've got to do this. And I said, okay. And I walked back in, and I looked at the young woman, and I looked at her hands, and even though she was banged up and beaten up, and um, I said to her, I said, can you draw? And she looked at me and her eyes got big like, what the Sam Hill lady, that's your job, you know. <laughs> but then she just kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, you know, okay, yeah, I can kind of draw. That's the, that was a little bit of a door that I needed to get in there. And I whipped out the pencil and the pad of paper and I gave it to her and I said, suspect number one. And we went through the process and I had her draw very crudely what this guy looked like. I then went and I took that information and I sat down and I drew an illustration of it. And I brought it back to her and she then took a pencil and she pointed and she made changes very softly. I, I was almost down to her face listening as she is pointing and telling me, change this, this is too big, the nose is too thin, it's thicker, it's this, it's that. And once we got through uh, drawing number one, uh, we went through drawing number two. This case is still outstanding, and um, it may never be solved. And this is very typical for many cases, but there it is. So when you talk about difficult witnesses or difficult circumstances and minimal things, forensic artists, uh, we, we try very hard to, um, to jump the fence and, and, and get to some sort of an image. That's, that's great. Uh, Sandy, I, I'm looking at the time. We Believe it or not, we're, we're, we're eight minutes uh, uh, and we're done. Um, and I, and I've, I've already talked about the fact that I, I would love to have you back because there's, there's so much of this subject that, uh, that we want to share with our, with our viewers. Uh, but, I, but I don't want you to leave this show without telling us, um, giving some, some mentoring to young artists who are out there listening to this show or will listen to this show uh, about, okay, how do you begin, uh, you know, how did you begin, how did you eventually uh, get hired by, the, uh, by uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Department? What do you recommend that somebody who might be interested in being a forensic artist, uh, how should they start, where should they go, what should they do? Well, there's several things. Number one, get your degree. And I don't care if you get it in English. I don't care if you get it in art. Getting it in art is extremely helpful. Uh, but an English or a science degree, many people, many forensic artists, wear two different hats. 
for example, they might be a detective, and they've they've had uh, they've had an art they have an art background, and they went to forensic art school. The agency sent them there, so they wear two hats, and the forensic art is a collateral duty for many people. That's the way it is, and that's quite all right. Sometimes they're a fingerprint tech, they're a secretary, they're a detective or an officer or a deputy sheriff. Um, so if you're interested in law enforcement, getting into law enforcement and getting into a larger agency will help you. Um, and, it, and, and then getting trained, but making certain that you go to the, get involved with an agency first and then see about working towards um, getting training or find out if your agency has a forensic artist, find a mentor that is willing to give you more more information about how it is with that agency. The smaller the agency, the less opportunities. But the larger the agency, the more opportunities. Um, and the last thing I would say is that you need to have really strong drawing skills and a strong stomach. Uh, you're going to go to autopsies. Um, you're going to go see some terrible things. You're going to you're going to um, and you've got to you've got to check the ego at the door, because you, ultimately you sit down at the direction of somebody else, and when you walk into that room, that person may not like you. They might decide they don't like you, and give you a hard time in the process. And you've got to have a real thick skin. It's not an easy job. Two questions. Uh, yeah. You you did mention uh, the federal. Are there many federal forensic artists? There's the FBI. Uh, the FBI has uh, for, uh, a forensic art unit, um, and I think um, for many of us artists, and I'm one of them, I've I've married up a graphic design and a forensic art career. The unit that I'm in, I not only do forensic art, but I do graphic design for my agency. And now I manage. I'm the manager of the unit. So everybody in the unit does forensic art but also does graphic design. So we feel we kill two birds with one stone and um, and and to make a career out of it. What about what? internships? Uh, uh, does Los Angeles uh, County Sheriff's Office have an internship program where somebody might be able to, a student in college might be able to work with you as an intern? Are there, are there other uh, departments that you're aware of? There might be other departments, but I can only speak about LA County Sheriff now. We do not have internships simply because these are sensitive cases. We don't want um, uh, we don't and unless you are a stakeholder in the agency and working for us full time, uh, we would not have you working on these kinds of cases. Okay, all right, very good. Um, let me, uh, before we end the show, I do want to uh, mention to our viewers uh, what's coming up uh, in the next several weeks, and then we'll get back uh, to say our, uh, our goodbyes to uh, Sandy for now. Uh, next week, uh, January 23rd, uh, we have three uh, guests who have been guests several times before, uh, uh, two retired homicide detectives from New York uh, City PD, uh, Joe uh, Giacalone and John Paolucci, um, and um, we've invited Dr. Rich Safferstein from New Jersey, uh, who is a forensic consultant and author of many textbooks in the area of forensic science. Uh, we're going to have an open forum type show. Uh, Joe and John said, hey, it would be a great opportunity to, uh, uh, to sit and, and chat with Dr. Safferstein about a number of uh, subjects going on uh, in the uh, uh, in the field. So next week we'll have an open forum show with uh, Joe Giacalone, John uh, Paolucci, and Dr. Rich uh, Safferstein. January 30th, we, uh, if, if you listen to last week's show, we, uh, we were talking about having a Dr. Bob Mead um, from Australia come to, be, uh, to become a, a guest, and thanks to uh, Laura, our producer. She made the contact. Uh, he's a toxicologist, and he uh, 
He runs the uh, Forensic Biology and Toxicology degree program at Murdoch University in Perth, Western uh, Australia. So, January 30th, we'll have Dr. Mead from Australia as our guest. February 6th, we have Dr. Barry Logan, who's the president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, um, who will be talking to you about the... Uh, uh, about the, the, the AAFS and the mentoring of, of young students to get them into the forensic science uh, um, career field and how they're doing that and, and a number of programs that the American Academy of Forensic Science has. So we look forward to having Dr. Logan. Uh, February 13th, we have Dr. Jane uh, Bach, who is a forensic uh, botanist. Uh, uh, February 30th, uh, we will be live at the American Academy of Forensic Science meetings, uh, and um, Sandy uh, will be there also, so maybe we can uh, get to chat with her a little bit while we're at the, uh, the, uh, the university fair, uh, talking to the representatives of all the uh, forensic programs throughout the country and uh, other countries also. February 23rd, we have Dorothy Sims, an attorney who... Uh, preps witnesses for trial uh, and cross-examining uh, um, while in a criminal or civil case. Uh, she uh, has worked in the Casey uh, uh, Anthony case and uh, she's uh, written uh, uh, several books in the area. So that brings all the way to February 23rd. Um, I want to thank uh, Sandy uh, again for being here. I know you're busy, and I and I know that there's a big time change. I hope uh, I hope you've enjoyed being on the show with us because we've certainly enjoyed having you. Uh, it was great. Tom. Thank you very much. I, I I know that we had so much more to talk about. I, I, I age regression and uh, and a number of things. So would you? please agree to come back and talk more about some of the other cases and the other things that you do. Is that possible? Absolutely. Great. And maybe uh, maybe you can get some, uh, some of your colleagues uh, from uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, to uh, come on also. It would be great to hear from other, other folks that, uh, that you respect uh, in the field. So uh, we'll, we'll set that up uh, real soon, and I will certainly see you uh, um, the, the week uh, of the 20th of February when we're in Seattle at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. So thank you. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to tell um, all our uh, viewers uh, that uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the content in this show. Please continue to tell your friends and colleagues to tune in and watch us every Thursday, uh, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and we also want you to know that ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation with the Hangout10.com Live TV show network. Uh, we recommend that you go and watch some of the other shows on the Hangout10.com uh, website. Uh, shows that uh, will teach you uh, various things and other content and other areas of, of expertise. Uh, we hope that the content presented in this show this evening as well as uh, previous shows uh, has opened up your, uh, your mind and curiosity to the wonders of forensics in criminal justice sciences. See you next time and thank you for watching ForensicWeek.com. Thank you.